You're listening to the Cantina Cast. Your home for thought-provoking Star Wars talk. Join Adler and Jonesy in breaking down the latest news, trailers, movies, and of course, your favorite characters from a galaxy far, far away. Hello everyone, welcome to the Cantina Cast. My name is Albert Padilla and this is episode 484 our coverage of The Bad Batch Season 2 in an episode called The Crossing, which was probably one of the more deeper uh, character pieces that we've had. And I'm not going to say in all of Star Wars, but in certainly when it comes to animation, it's very, we don't get a lot of these moments that we got here. And it's something that I've been looking forward to wanting to see more of in The Bad Batch specifically, but more on that in a little bit. And speaking of great characters, Jonesy's with us tonight. Jonesy, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing well, sir. How are you this Thursday? running like a madman i had some wiring problems the falcon's up and running though we got everything fixed it's going good but all i could think about was like you're gonna tear this apart now i'm trying to get us out of here <laughs> well in the right before we came on like as the credit the intro was running i had lost power so i had to run around my desk to go kick power I came back on got my headset on put this mic in front of me and then boom it was like right into it so i'm a little winded that's why but you wouldn't know either way i'm impressed I'm, I'm actually super impressed that you're able to get around the table that fast. That's very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> well, there's a will, there's a way. So, yeah, no, it was, um, this is, uh, we'll get more into the episode a little bit, but uh, I was kind of longing for something like this, especially with a character like Tech right. of, of all the characters, right? Which is, I think, was a very interesting and conscious decision and choice by the writers. Right, and we finally got, I mean, we knew we were going to get something from Omega as well, but they had to throw Tech into the situation with her was really, was actually pretty cool. All right. How about a little bit of news first? So quick congratulations to John Favreau, who has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Yeah. That's pretty exciting. If you, if you remember, John Favreau's career in acting actually starts back like in 1990, I think. I think he started on Rudy, right? Mm -hmm. I think that was his first film. And of course, he's such a Don't staple. About that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's Sorry. such a staple in like the Disney era of not only Star Wars, but with Marvel, of course, with Iron Man and just yep. all the things that he's done, all his appearances and so, uh, you know, huge congratulations to him as well. Well deserved and uh, pretty exciting stuff to see. Uh, and celebration news, because again, this is now about a month and a half out. Ewan McGregor, Andy Serkis, and Ian McDiarmid, of course, are all going to be there. So that's pretty exciting. The the heavy hitters coming in, if you will, the uh, the kind of the, the big names. Still no Daisy Ridley. <laughs> Not yet, but she's coming. I've, that's what I hear. Yeah, the Patreon show actually did a little sound effect after you mentioned. Her. Oh, did you? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't do that very often, but okay. I had to do it this time because there was such a long pregnant pause. That Hopefully it was the uh, X-Files theme. If you got that, then I'll love you forever. Nope, I don't nope. want to. Okay. Well, yeah, I can't give you too many reasons to love me. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a good run, buddy. I appreciate it, though. Go ahead. It was. You know, we, we try hard, but, you know, sometimes we fall a little short. <laughs> uh, and then we've got a little bit of other news, uh, mostly in the comic and book front. And share my screen here for those. Oh, by the way, if you are listening to this, we do a live stream. So cantinacast.com slash YouTube. Uh, but real quick, in honor of Women's History Month, Peach Momoko is doing a bunch of variant covers for Star Wars, and she is really cool. Like, she does a very unique style of art, which is just really great. I love her art. Yeah. Yeah, and so she's got one here for Vader that has Sabe on the cover. Yeah. We have oh, uh, Barack man. Sylvain for the Blade, right? Pretty exciting. I have to get that one. On the Dr. Africa, we got Dominic Tag, which is pretty dope. Yep. With her metal arm and everything else. We got some other here's for Hidden Empire, Han Solo. I mean, all of the major, all the, wow. the, the issues this month are going to have them. So if you're a huge Peach Momoko fan, you're going to want to pick a lot of these up. And for those listening, I apologize. I'm just kind of scrolling through. But this Jabba's Palace one, actually, Jabba's Palace is a comic I'm going to pass on. But now but I see this Leia. You got to get the cover. I know Nazi Leia in this, this Boosh cover. And I'm like, well, yep. I don't know what she's got in her hand. It's almost like she's levitating something in the force. So that's pretty, mm. yeah, that's pretty cool. There is, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, these then, are great. Yeah, they are. So these are all come out, of course, just next month. And in other news, we have a cover for the Edge of Balance precedent. This is the Daniel Jose Older manga. And so we've got uh, the Wookiee here. I forgot. Is it Aka, I believe, is his name. And so he's going to, this is a bit younger uh, Wookiee, but he's going to Dalna, of course, because Path of the Open Hand is causing some, some ruckus. As they should. I believe this is the formal end of phase two of the High Republic. Hmm. So it uh, might be a pretty big book here to go get. And it sounds like it will be 
canon. It won't be like the uh, kind of like the other the other edge of balance was I guess technically canon, right? Or was it, it was canon? Yeah, canon was adjacent. Just, no, it was canon. It was just set so far away, and like it was it was kind of an isolated story that really didn't. I mean, it felt the impacts of what was going on in Phase One, but it didn't have an impact to the events of Phase One. Event didn't have a direct touch point to it exactly. Yeah. Okay, other than selling Geos and a couple other. Right. But this characters. one definitely does. And there's a, there's a hosh, I believe is what they're called. The little spider, spider looking creature. I believe that's what they're called. So anyway, you can find all this over on starwars.com. Of course, if you're listening in, you're not seeing what we've got on the, on the live stream here, but uh, really cool covers out there. Just wanted to share those with y'all as we kind of got started this morning or this evening, whatever it is. It depends on where you're at. It could be morning, could be evening. You could be having a drink right now. I wish I was having a drink right now. Yeah. Hey, speaking of drinks. <laughs> <laughs> we we should we're celebrating in a toast because we have a new Patreon member. So a huge con, uh, huge thank you, congratulations to Jeff as well. Jeff uh, Valier joined us about a week ago. Apologize for the lateness on getting uh, this announcement out there. So he joined our After Dark tier. So Jeff, thank you so much for joining the team. We really do appreciate it. And of course, a very special thank you to all of our now part of the tribe members: Mike, Rob, Lauren, Dante, Risk, Justin, Jackson, Sharkman, Dan, Daz, Isabella, and Uncle Leon. And of course, our delusions of grandeur members, Rod, Kathy, and Hard Kennedy. Again, thank you all so much. If you are curious about Patreon and all of our cool content that, well, we think it's cool, all of our amazing content over on Patreon, kttcast.com slash Patreon. We'll find all of that is, all that you got there. Uh, the, the, the kind of the two main things you can grab from all that is that for just a dollar, you get early access to all of our regular streams, so the ones that you're listening to right now. And if you would like access to the special content, the Patreon only content, as well as some of the, the live streams that we do uh, for the Patreon, those are starting at only $2. And if you want to join us on the show, take a look at those top tiers as yep. cars <laughs> roll by my, my neighborhood <laughs> here. Sorry about that. And we spent, we just spent a good amount of time uh, last night, as a matter of fact, talking about uh, a lot of possibilities, well, four technically possibilities about who the believer was, who was uh, shown in, in the most recent, well, up until last, yesterday. The uh, yeah, who that was. And so we kind of tossed around some ideas, some theories, and it was kind of fun taking a trip down memory lane and talking about a lot of legends, uh, clone troopers and, and variations thereof. Yeah, that was something we didn't really we didn't lean into as much as far as like advertising and, and whatnot. When I was editing, I was like, man, we didn't really mention that we were going to really is kind of going to hardcore legends after, after about after we got, kind of got through the intro aspect of it all. Yeah. You yeah. know, pulling those 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 clones out of the. Out of the old memory banks, there was a was a lot of fun, and so if you are if you love legends and you love clone legends, especially the different types of clone troopers that were out there at the time, Rob, yeah, that's a show you might want to go check out. Rob, yep. Well, Rob's already a Patreon member, so well, he's going to go check it out anyway. Yeah, no, that was fun. Uh, we'll have to get with the marketing team and figure out how to get that fixed for next time. Well, I I kind of already fixed it because I did the show. Oh, okay, good. But anyway, that's out there already. So if you are a Patreon member, go get it now. And if you're considering it. Maybe go start with that one and see if you like it. Maybe you will. Maybe you won't. You definitely will. You do. You will. Yeah, we don't produce garbage mostly, usually, sometimes. <laughs> Never mind. Sometimes, though. But when the garbage is out, it's hot. It's hot garbage. Yeah. You know, okay, it wasn't so hot garbage, though, Albert. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to keep interrupting you with questions. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, let's get the show going here because i got a lot to talk about. Let's start with the, I guess, our opening thoughts and comments around the crossing because it, the, the way this episode starts off, Feels like it's going to be another, you know, mission of the week, right? Especially when you read the description. However, as soon as the, and this is, I, we were talking, I was talking to Jonesy about this last night. And I don't think it was, I think it was after or before. It was right after we did the Patreon show. We were off air. Right. But I said, there was something about this episode that felt different because of the way it started. In fact, I think the first minute, minute and a half, minute and 30 seconds, there's no dialogue, which is very, which is probably not that. Is, I think that is probably uncommon for the Bad Batch and just Star Wars animation. There's something going on. But it was just the tone, right? The setting, the music, everybody was in silence. You know, you, we can talk about whether or not they're kind of coming off of feeling the the effects of having lost a member, even though they may not be openly talking about it. They could be just, you know, it's on their mind. But it was a very different kind of tone that was set earlier on. And that kind of continue on, continued on through the episode, which I thought was really great because it did feel like this. I got a lot of thoughts on this, but then I'll, I'll kind of pass it over to you. It, this one felt a little different in that. I don't know if I'm like 10 years old, like if this was really the most gripping anime Star Wars animation I've ever seen. I, as an adult and as a parent, like this one hit a lot of really deep chords with me, uh, which we'll get into a little bit. But I really enjoy this. This was a lot of emotion and thinking and, uh, you know, just what what it means to, for, for people to go through change, which is something we all face 
every day of our lives and just being that for first and foremost front and center in star wars especially with the mega i thought was pretty special yeah and i think it's also how do we deal with change but also how do others interpret change and how do we meet them on their own terms right and step outside of our own comfort zone i think some of those are really difficult things to really capture and to to really talk about sometimes because unless you're in that situation you don't have a reason to and, and unless you're living it you know we all have something but I, I really like that we got an insight into the way that tech you know views this and he's he is more self-aware than maybe we've given him credit for in some you know in some ways uh, but what i what i like about you said at the beginning you said that the you know there wasn't a lot of dialogue it was very quiet i like that omega what I took from that is Omega really sets the tone for the squad, you know, for mm -hmm. the family, right? I mean, her, her demeanor is what sets the mood for practically everything. And the more I thought about some of the episodes, I'm like, okay, this is actually kind of true. While it's a bit subtle in some ways, as soon as she's down and she's withdrawn from the group, you just feel it immediately. And I think that's what you had. And they had, they, they just, they displayed it in such a great way. She's lagging behind, you know, she's not motivated. She, you know, she has all of the, the outward symptoms of, you know, some sort of depression or, you know, at least just being down in the dumps a little bit. And so I really like that they captured that spirit of all of that. And, and her demeanor set the entire tone for the team. Yeah, it, you're right. And, and that some of that, again, I don't want to read too much into that, but we've been talking about what is Omega's role? What is her special ability? And it become it's becoming more and more apparent that she's it's making the team feel bad about themselves because they're not <laughs> feeling they're not supporting her properly. She's like the team spirit, right? She's definitely somebody who is an empath. We see that, I mean, in countless examples of not just with the team members, but other people that they just come in contact with, right? That's that's kind of what her she leads with that front foot. So so yeah, in, in a lot of ways, if she, you know, if Mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy, right? And, <laughs> right. and that's kind of what we were seeing there uh, early in the earlier stages. Maybe, maybe not. We'll get into that here in a little bit as well. So, but give me your, what other uh, what other thoughts came to or did you have? Or I guess for this episode, a couple of things. The, the music really gripped me right away. It mm -hmm. really captured this kind of Southwest vibe. It was it was almost like this Western feel, but with a, a bit of like a Spanish overtone to it. Yeah, which I just yeah. really love because it just captured what I view like the Southwestern United States, like just from a visual aspect, the, the rocks, the, the colors and the music just perfectly. Kevin kind of just grabbed it immediately. It was, it was absolutely perfect. I thought about you because they definitely used a matte painting in this one. The, the background was, <laughs> right, yeah. was the sunset and everything, just the oranges and the reds and the yellows, and all of that. It was definitely a matte painting. Yeah. It was just front and center. It was absolutely gorgeous. We got to get to the bottom of that though, because now that's three instances where I'm like, that is a matte painting. You can't convince me it's not. And I, I just love that idea that they're doing that with, you know, Star Wars 3D animation when they don't have to, right? That's the cool thing about it. Yeah, but it still just blends in so perfectly as background. Yeah, sure. You know, and of course we got Hondo Anaka. That was really exciting no, as well. stop it. Do not. <laughs> like of all the things, like was it Wednesday? We hadn't even talked about the show, but you were already texting me about this because I saw that and I go, oh my God, this is like, <laughs> fodder for Jonesy. He's going to be all over this. And my here, here it comes. I get started getting messages about Hondo and Naka. I'm like, that's not him, dude. It's not Hondo. I know that, but, but, it does but you like definitely it. get the, <laughs> so it looks a lot though, right? Like the, the outfit and the, the pirate vibe and, and in discord, we were talking a little bit about this too, that it just gives off that vibe. I mean, you, you cover, had the face coverage. You got the, the feathers for the hair kind of you know, dropping down the helmet. Yep. Different, but similar. A little different. His, yeah, he has like more of a shell looking thing, like a tortoise shell kind of helmet. And again, the, the, the skin was much paler than, than Hondo in general, but it was still really cool that you just got those vibes and they're just teasing you with it. And really how cool would it be? I mean, cause what's a pirate without a ship? Yeah, exactly. Pirate ship, right? Anything else? Oh, we got lots of things to talk about tonight, but yeah, we'll just, we'll just start there. Let me, let me share some, I guess, uh, the rest of my opening thoughts. I mean, I mentioned this was probably the more, most character building episode that we had from the Bad Batch. And, to, and I, again, I want to, I, I don't want to use those words too heavy because I get it. We only had about. They were really brief moments. Well, they were brief, but it's like, we don't get those with the Bad Batch, you know? It's very, it's only like. In the, we don't get them with tech. Exactly. I mean, that's right. the really important one here is we don't get them with tech. And for him to take a moment to actually reflect mm -hmm. and, and be a bit vulnerable in that way. Yep. Is, is really important. I think it's really, it was really cool to see that. So I'm with, I started to interrupt you, but no, no, no. Yeah. With him, it's just so important because we just don't ever have the opportunity to, to see it because he's, he never gives us the opportunity for the most part. Yeah. 
Yeah, and we talk about like watching the Bad Batch, right? We want the story to move forward. We want the big mythological kind of clones conspiracy and all that stuff. But at the same time, there's a lot to be said about just getting a moment to sit down and breathe, live with the characters, get in their heads, kind of understand what they're thinking, what they're feeling, what they're going through. I think they do a really good job of just showing that through the animation. And we've talked, we've counted a number of examples where we're just little, you know, the way they look at each other, right? The animation has come so far. They can do a lot of that storytelling without having them speak or say anything. So I think that's good. But getting to hear them say these things is so important. I think at least it is for me because I was able to, I feel like I've connected with the character of tech for the first time ever. Like he's been such a, he's so different than my personality. And like some of the stuff that he said in this episode, like pissed me off. Like I just like, and I get why, I mean, that's just who he is. Right. But I don't really, I don't like associating with people like that so much. Right. It's really hard for me to have, relationships with people that really aren't in touch with their feelings or can't express themselves or just have this, you know, I don't know. I, I don't want to sound too, I don't want to get too hard down on tech, but he's very different than me. And I don't have, I just, it's very alien. And so for the first time, because he finally said that, I felt like Omega were like, okay, I think I get this guy now. It, there, there is something there, right? He's not a callus. He's not a robot. He's not a, a series of equations and numbers. There is a living being in him. And uh, until now, Somewhere. He's never really done much to give me anything more than he's going to give the most logical Spock response to, uh, you know, a question or a situation. I will say this, though. I was really proud of Hunter as well. And it was really cool to see Hunter be vocal and understand what Omega was like, yeah. experiencing, at least be able to interpret. Now, I mean, was he doing enough? Maybe not. But he at least understood why she was upset in general and then why and then how and why tech what he said was just so insensitive yeah from how she felt yep. right and and even though he's being very matter of fact and very pragmatic about it hunter understanding what she needs in that moment given the context of them their situation you know hunter's not really able to give a lot of that either but yeah that he's able to call him out and say you need to go fix this like you need to go do it and give tech that opportunity as well I think was important too. And I think showed a really a lot of growth for Hunter from where we've seen him over the last season and a half now. So the, uh, the other, the other quick notes I have, uh, I said, this was the humanization of tech. This was a, a story I thought was really good. And I went back. So I was, I was a little surprised. And I, I think yesterday when we were talking about it, I don't only, I'd only seen it once. And I said, I wonder who wrote this because it felt very different than a normal star Wars story. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. And I don't want to get into the whole discussion about, do writers need to be, you know, in tune with Star Wars? Or can you bring somebody, quote, off the streets that's done other stuff and have implant them into a Star Wars story and tell a good story, effective story? That's exactly what happened here. And I'm not, I don't want to take anything away from Brooke Roberts. OK, Brooke Roberts is the writer. Uh, of course, it is a story by Matt Mcnovitz, and he's been doing a lot of these already. Right. But the way her what she did is she came in and almost agnostic of Star Wars just told us a story about the people like you, this could have been anywhere. And I, and I know people are very upset about that. Like, Oh, this isn't really star Wars. It could have been any, it can, it can have been told anywhere else, but that's the beauty of it. Right. What are you looking I, at? I, I don't throw my hands up oh. thinking like uh, that people can, yeah. that everything has to be X wings and blasters and lightsabers. And we can't just have a, you know, a good story with the characters that we like and yep. it be set in star Wars. And we still have a very humanistic moment. You know, that yes. it's just, is BS to me. I just don't understand it. You, you talk about how you get upset about certain things. I get upset about that stuff. And, and you don't, and again, I don't want to take anything from away from like the, the current Pew Pew writers either. I mean, they're fully capable of telling a story like this, an emotional okay. story or getting in the heads of the characters, but to have somebody that kind of comes in from the outside and bring that grounded conversation that they have. And even some of the things that you alluded to earlier that we'll get into with Hunter. Um, I just thought she was, she did a really good job. So Brooke Roberts, thank you so much. She was uh I went and looked. She's never done anything in Star Wars ever. Um, it looks like her biggest run was she was uh, one of the writers or story contributors for The Flash from like 2014 to 2017. Yeah. Also known when when The Flash was good. Right. <laughs> well, I don't. I've, I, that's what I was getting from like doing the research. Like everybody seemed to love that portion of it. Yeah, so early yeah. episodes. Yeah. Yeah. So she did a really good job. So I, I felt like they did a great job in kind of telling that story. It was coarsely, you know, definitely directed. The music was amazing. Visual effects, once again, like, I don't understand why this is, this thing isn't going to land some kind of, you know, technical, at least it should be getting some kind of a technical acknowledgement rewards of some site. 
And I think the the times where they did not use any music, I think it was also just as powerful. And we've talked about this in previous episodes where not having sound and not having music, you know, in certain instances, whether it's an action sequence or whether it's a very intense emotional discussion or just the suspense, you know, I think those are really important to know when to use it and when to back off. Yeah. And so it was a great decision, I think, to just allow tech and Omega to have the moment and not have anything get in the way. Yep. Yeah. No, it was good. A lot of, there was a lot of, even visually just in that cave and the limited lighting, all of that plays into the mood and sets that tone. And then the last thing I've got, and this is, we'll kind of kick this off and, and kind of go right into the, the, the full breakdown here. But I have a question for you because I, I ask this a lot and some, sometimes it's more obvious than others. But what did, what was your takeaway on the title? The title says the crossing. And like, I don't know, like I have, I have a very in your face, really not a lot to think about kind of way to explain what the crossing is. Then I have kind of the next level, which is a little bit deeper, maybe, you know, but, and then I've got one, that's a complete whack theory and I'm happy <laughs> to share all three of them, but I don't, uh, I don't know that I walked away with like a solid, Oh yeah, I know exactly what they're talking about here. No, I mean, there's nothing, it, it didn't seem like there was any obvious, I mean, physical thing, right? They didn't cross something. They didn't try to do this or that. I think if anything, it, it felt like more of a crossing between Omega and tech and kind of meeting in the middle and, and finding common ground about some things and understanding each other a little bit better. Yeah. So crossing that bridge, if you will, or crossing that, that, that gap and, and maybe more so tech than Omega because Omega is just kind of feeling right. She's just kind of going through the feels. And tech is having to go out there and actually meet her and, and really pull himself across rather than anybody else doing it or pushing him or anything else. So yeah. that was, that was more or less how I took the title because I really couldn't find much, anything else that really made sense that I liked at least. Okay. Well, I won't give you my, I'll give you all three of mine here at the end. Cause it, that question okay. I have at the very at the end in our final thoughts. So something to, to think about. Way to put me on an Island up front. And then you'll just come at the end and be like, <laughs> well, here's all my okay, amazing so ideas. No, all right. So listen, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be fair. I think, I think you're right. I think that's probably where I, that was my middle one, right? There was a crossing of their personalities or coming to some understanding, right? Mutual understanding of how they, who they are and how they process things and their emotions and feelings and all that. That seems like a very deep kind of a way to, to, to put the title in there, right? The one that was really uh, in your face was that, I mean, again, I guess at one point they did cross from one mind to the other. And I thought, oh, they're crossing. Look, they're crossing through the thing. And then there was a stampede. So that, that one's really terrible. But I have one that I think is, uh, again, I'll say that one for the very end. All right, you, can say, you can say the whack theory for the end. I'll, I'll yeah, because the it's actually a whack theory, but it's like, whoa, yeah, maybe you're right, Albert. Oh, it's going to be one of those. No, nobody will, see, nobody will be saying that. I was about to say this is going to be epic because no one ever says that. <laughs> Overselling it. Okay. Uh, this was directed by Nathaniel Villanueva. He's directed a number of these now. He's just, it's been the same crew with the exception of the writer, which again, Brooke Roberts. Is. Um, by the way, this was brought to my attention by several of our followers last week. Right. And I did not get a chance to, to talk about it last week because I just completely slipped my mind, but they fixed the freaking skip intro button. Now it hangs around too long. <laughs> no, you can't, no, you can't win. You can't make your, you can't make you happy. Johnson. They did. They did fix it though. That was nice to see. Have you, did you use it though? I did. I did. Oh. And it's, is it coincidental that I come out on the air finally and say, fix the dang button in the very next episode it's fixed. I don't think hey, so. We, we tell everyone that Disney listens to us now. Yeah. So, I mean, they don't, but I mean, they do. I got that off my chest. I'm surprised we just close up the show now. <laughs> right. We just call We're it 25 a moral minutes into it. We talk about it. We'll see you next week. Yeah. Okay, so this first part I called We Bought a Mine. So Sid, she's bought this mine, which I've got all kinds of questions around, but more on that later. Um, and they're there to kind of extract this Ipsium, which I'd never heard of before. I guess it's a, yeah, it's kind of like a- Yellow, yellow brother or sister to coaxium. To coaxium, right. It sounds yeah. like coaxium. In its raw state, it's very unstable. Yeah, raw state, very unstable. We've seen this before, very combustible. Right. And, you know, there's the storm and that, that storm is very symbolic. Like, I don't think they, they showed the storm and you could hear the storm. And even the episode ends, like when it fades to black, they hang on the rolling thunder for like two seconds. Right. And I think all of that is purposeful. I think there's, it was a conscious decision, but the symbolism of a storm coming, like it, it, we know there's something going to happen. I mean, we're, 
what, nine episodes into the series. We've got uh, six, seven left, yet, whatever that is, eight left, um, seven. And um, well, technically five, because this is going to be a, there's going to be a part two to this. Right. So we've only got five episodes left and we we're waiting for the drama. So well, I think bendu, that they may have the been trying to coming. signal that there's something really rolling in here soon. Yeah, the Bendu. <laughs> I hadn't even thought about that. Shame on me. But yeah, it could be Bendu. That'd be kind of cool. But um, yeah, talk about fan service. So, but I did like the, uh, I did like that they kept coming back to it, right? And it was very ominous. They would, they would stare off into and, and kind of watch the, the clouds starting to develop and then go away. And he's talking about how the storms are very volatile. They're kind of coming and going. There's unpredictability here. All of this seems like it is symbolic of what's happening in the series, sometimes with the characters. Uh, again, maybe reading too much into that, but I, I did enjoy that. Um, okay, but what we're seeing here, and I don't want to, like, we've talked, we joke about this a lot, but what, I think what we're seeing here is this, you know, the proverbial stages of teen development, right? And, and I don't want to get into a whole, like, you know, TED talk about what that means for anybody that's not aware. Uh, but in a nutshell, right, you have teams, they go through different stages and they get to the kind of high, the, the highest stage, which is performing, which I think, you could argue they were probably there right before Echo left. And it's part of the natural progression for teams, national, uh, natural development of teams to uh, ha- take a step back, right? To recess in some way, especially when there's a change within the team structure. And that's exactly what we're seeing here, right? We had somebody like, a, like Echo, well-established. He took, it took a while for him to kind of get in his groove, kind of find his place. And once he was there, they were relying on him for a lot of things. They were operating, they were performing, they were at that highest level. Now he stepped away and we're seeing the state, the teams now fall back a couple stages to maybe like a storming stage or forming where they're arguing, they're trying to figure things out, right? They're dealing with emotions. Uh, people now have more responsibility than they did before. All of this is all natural things. And although they never really signal that so much directly, they never talk about it, or it's very indirect. That's exactly what's happening. You see the brothers, right? Her parents are arguing constantly. You can see Omega watching, looking at them going, what's going on? We never do this, right? They're never arguing. Everything's been working just fine. All of this feeds into this theme about what does it mean to, or how do you adjust to change? How do you cope with change? What are the coping mechanisms that people have for change? And how does that impact other people? And that's exactly what we saw with Tech. His coping mechanism was like flies in the face of what Omega would do. Like she's just shocked. She's actually, you know, uh, uh, offended by the fact that he's coping the way he does. So, okay, I'll kind of pause there, but I think there were a lot of instances where we were seeing that, not just between Omega, but we were seeing it amongst uh, Hunter, Wrecker, Tech, Tech and Wrecker, obviously, for some of the things that had happened to. Right, and so the, what's the one thing you do, if you've ever listened to a coach talk about this type of thing you know, for like leadership training, things like that, whenever you go back and you have change within the group after you've been in a, like a high-performing team, the very first thing you do is you have to acknowledge what's different. Yeah. You have to talk about the problem, right? You have to go back to it and put it back there. And this is a team, this is a group that just doesn't excel at this, right? Because they just, I mean, why would they? They've never, they've never been trained to do any of this stuff. They don't have any experience with it. Well, I mean, they have a lot of experience with change, but it was always within the confines of a mission or of the military, not necessarily of a family. And that's when the, the comments that Omega or the question she asked tech later on really have such a, a his, his approach to the problem and his approach to understanding things is what's been finally challenged. And she finally has the, the it, it out there along with Hunter and in record to an extent, but that's the very first thing you do. You just acknowledge that there's a difference mm-hmm. and that's what Omega's not getting. I mean, she feels it, you know, she's, she wants to talk about it. Maybe she's tried to talk about it, but for whatever reason it is not coming out of this group because they're just going to be like, well, he's gone. We just need to deal with it. We need to change. We need to, we just need to adapt. We'll right. do what we always do, mm-hmm. but there's no room for feeling any of that. It's the mission because otherwise if you feel too much, you die too much. Right. I mean, that's the mentality they have is that it's a weakness. If you, if you dwell on that type of thing, you have to, you just have to adapt because otherwise you might not survive, figure out the, it's a problem to solve, not necessarily a, it's not necessarily reforming a, an environment or a, a team dynamic or anything like that. It's more of just a problem. Yeah. And in some ways it parallels like, you know, what the Jedi mentality, you know, when like how many times have we seen, especially like in the high Republic, like there's Jedi falling over left and right. And so many times they're just like, okay, he's dead. 
he did what he needed to, or she did what they needed to do and we move on. Like we don't have time to, you know, pay remorse or anything like that. Right. And that's where Bell Zetafar was really struggling, right? He's almost kind of like the Omega in that situation, not to bring in the High Republic, but he's going through a lot of that emotional stuff when everybody else around him seems to be okay. Like, you know, so what? We lost some of the greatest people we've ever had, but yeah, it sucks. But, you know, they're part of the force and we adapt, we change, we move on, we grow from it uh, like it's no big deal. And he's still struggling. Like, man, this just seems out of place. This, is, this isn't this is right. Like, how are we not grieving? And I think that's where Omega's at. She's wondering, like, we've lost a team member and we're just moving on. Like, no one wants to, you know, acknowledge the fact that that person's gone. And for them, it's a different perspective. And, and I get all that, but we'll we'll talk more in just a few minutes here. So, um, so back to the story, this is where Hunter and Omega are kind of set to look out, right? They're feeling the effects of, well, they don't have this other person that they can plant with Omega. That was kind of her role, her. And I, mean, I think we saw it in two examples in previous episodes where it was her and Echo that were kind of left behind to be the watch group. And so now he's not there. So it's gotta be Wrecker. And so that's putting them at a disadvantage. Um, and then um, there's also the, uh, they eventually find that they need Omega. And so they go out there and they kind of bring her in at that point. But I want to get to the poacher because I know we talked about Hondo and Nock already in joking, but who is like, who is this? And here's what this, this plays into my whack theory. Maybe I'll just, have, I'll probably just naturally kind of explain it as I move along here, because I have a question about, this is a like for this is a deserted planet, right? Uh, maybe not. Maybe it is. Maybe it isn't. But at least the area that they're in doesn't look like anybody's been here in a very long time. And suddenly, out of nowhere, you have this one ship in the entire galaxy that happens to land here on this planet to go get uh, Ipsium, which there doesn't seem to be a lot of. Hmm. Right. And you've got somebody that tracked them and followed them, the Marauder, the Clone Force, right? How that. I have a hard time wrapping my head around, like, how would somebody even know them, know that they were there, but much less track them? So I had this conspiracy theory that this is Sid. That Sid is the one that sent him on this kind of like, go get this. I need this. I bought a mine. Go mine it. There's, and they come, they get there and they're like, what the heck? There's nothing even here. They got somebody that knew exactly how to get into the ship, where it was going. I mean, I mean, sure, if they followed them there. But then this person out of nowhere, and he looks kind of young. I mean, I don't, maybe he or she looks kind of young. They look right. young to me. So I just have a hard time thinking that's just somebody. What's the purpose if she was, if she was behind, or so are you suggesting that she arranged this situation to, mm-hmm. to happen? Mm-hmm. And it feeds into the title. And it, it feeds into the title. Okay. Uh, so what purpose would that serve? Do you have it? Well, we don't, we don't know. I think, well, I think we, if this comes out, I mean, we didn't find out in this episode. But maybe we find out in episode two or the next, the sequel part of it, part two or whatever, or later down the road. But I don't know. I, this one doesn't seem plausible. Like I'd have a hard time. Yeah. Jeff is all over this. Oh, it said uh, Trandoshans. I'm telling you. He's got a yeah. thing against Trandoshans. Jeff does. He does have a thing against Trandoshans. He has a serious prejudice. And now he's, he's self-aware <laughs> and he says it. So, I mean, I guess that's something. Thanks for owning it, Jeff. That's right. Now, so, okay. So I, I, had, I hadn't considered that. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Cause I mean, again, you could. I mean, there's other ways you could theorize around this, that there is a, yeah, it's an old mining place. They feel like most of it's dried up. It, this is kind of like, it looked like the old West, right? After the gold boom busted, mm-hmm. right? And so, but there's probably still some people around and they've got devices that can track ships. And so when they have something in, you send a scout, hey, it kind of works out. You, know, you steal a ship, you know? And again, it, the stealing of the ship progressed the story and helped give Omega more of a voice too, because it was, it, it was like that final straw of sorts, maybe not the final straw, but it was another in a series of losses for her that all of a sudden said, okay, well now you've taken my home. Not mm-hmm. only did you take one of my, my brothers, my friends, my dads, and now you took my home. And now I have, it feels like I have nothing all of a sudden I've gone from having like a great life. And now I've just lost everything. I mean, it's this it, kind of a dramatic swing of sorts. Right. You know, so I, some of it's about maybe a plot device of sorts just to further that and, and give them a, a challenge here. But it's an interesting, I'm trying to think why Sid would do that or why that scenario would work. And that, that would be a tough one to, to figure out. I guess we'd have to wait for retrieval. Uh, we can, we can talk more about it later. I, I just, it seems like it's all too convenient. Um, and it just went too easily. It is Star Wars though. Yeah. Well, that's true too. And I don't want to put too much blame on Wrecker, although I guess, Tech was right. I mean, it was his fault. I mean, he couldn't see the ship. I mean, when they said to look out for it, I'm like, you can't see it. I was like, 
How is he going to look? But again, you, you kind of expect. Yeah, that's a bad leadership decision. It's Hunter's fault. You kind of expect you can see everything, though, because, I mean, everything's kind of in plain sight. But sure. Whatever. Yeah. All right. So this is where they go back and get Omega. They come back inside. <clears throat> the plan is to get her to, to kind of help get up into the little cracks and, and nooks and get some of that, uh, the Ipsy out of there. And Omega, is, this is where she's really, this is kind of that one. This is the scene where she's really feeling bummed about having lost Echo. You know, they're definitely, she's going through the stages of loss and grief, right, as well. We can get into that, too, if we want. Um, and they all are. But she mentions that it's weird without him around. And, like, in her head, and I think you were kind of talking about this earlier, but in her head, it's like this guy's past. Like, he's he's gone. He's dead. And for the other guys, you know, they're they're more mature and, and they're soldiers. And so they look at it as, as what they said. This is, he's just on a different mission, right? He may not be part of the team, but... He's still around like no one died here, child. And that's where I feel like they have that really they have a hard disconnect. Like they, they really can't connect with her and kind of understand where she's coming from. It's not she's not speaking in black and white terms, whereas they are. Well, and I think I think of a couple of different things. If you look at what Omega's experienced so far since we've met her, I mean, her home world has been destroyed of Camino by the very people who employed them. Mm -hmm. Crosshair left the team largely due to. While it was it was largely a, a disagreement about how to follow orders or what their purpose was, yeah. In Omega's perspective, she's probably a huge component of that too because Crosshair did not like her and felt threatened by her, right? In whatever capacity, so he left the group, right? And I think that's the important part. And now you have Echo who willingly left and abandoned her, right? To where all these abandonment issues now are starting to creep up. Of like, why why would someone else want to leave now? You know, Crosshair already left. And yeah, there were other things, but Echo willingly left. And she's not quite mature enough and old enough to really understand all of the things that Echo has experienced and gone through of why this was so important for him to leave. And quite honestly, again, they didn't take the time to really help her understand any of that stuff either. Mm -hmm. You know, to help her understand where his position was, but also just to hear her out and let her get it out and let her feel that she is supported and that they all feel it too. But they will move forward together rather than we just have to move forward. Yeah, you know, we just we just decided we just individually we we get over it and we move on. Yeah. So but, I think those are the things for Omega to keep in mind as you it, you kind of look at what else has gone on of why this would be so extreme. And again, she got really close with Echo and like she has with everybody, but I think it was just another one and that it really, really hurt because it brought up a lot of the, those those old memories with Crosshair, I think in particular, and maybe with even with like Nala Say and and Tom Way, all these other ones that have you know, tried, I mean, one, and Tom Way got killed right. trying to help protect her, right? Yeah, I mean, she's had a pattern of people coming into her lives and either being killed <laughs> or, you know, just being taken away or, or leaving for whatever reason, on, right. you know, the, and, and for her, it's like, okay, so what is the stability, right? The stability is the core members of the Bad Batch and Echo was a part of that. And so now you remove that piece, then everything else that's going around them gets exasperated. Right. Yeah. Losing the ship, like you said, um, you know, losing Echo, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, she's got some trust issues. Right. She doesn't feel like like tech even trusts her. She kind of questions that a little bit later. Like, wow, I can't believe you even really trust me or, believe, you know, believe in me in that way. So this is all kind of starting to pile up. On, and there's there may be some in here, too. I mean, she's we don't know how exactly how old she is, but you know, she may be going through her preteen angst. Right. So if you're a parent, you know exactly what we're talking about. This yeah, is. The sass was starting to come out. That Man, was for sure. tell you what, it, it happens. And I know, I mean, we all go through it and it's, it's different as a parent, but. I mean, her, her talking really slowly when she was drilling, like, I know. I mean, uh -huh. I think I probably did that <laughs> earlier today. <you> know? <laughs> right. So, so yeah, I mean, there's probably just some, uh, some of that just kind of going on. Um, and then on top of that, you know, she's, like I said, the, the, the analogy that I use that these are her parents and they're sitting there bickering and arguing and. They're not functioning like a team. And this is all very alien to her because up until now, I mean, yeah, they've had some pretty, uh, pretty bad moments, significant moments, but they've stuck together and they've made it through all of this stuff kind of to what, you know, Tech was saying, but they've never, they persevered as a team. In her eyes, they persevered as a family and now things are not so great, right? Things are a little bit rocky. Well, and I think to be fair, the, the team bickers a lot anyway. They always have. I mean, they're just all very different and they... They expect a lot of each other. It's very high expectations, I think, of what the, each one's supposed to deliver. But everything is just exacerbated now for Omega, like you were saying before. 
-hmm. everything is just heightened every every little thing is just touching that that raw nerve and so while them arguing and calling each other out isn't necessarily anything new from what we've seen they're usually pretty critical of one another it's all just so much more raw and heightened for her right now i think yeah i think i think where the difference is though is we they there was two shots where they focused on omega like we left the argument which we've never done and then they put the camera front and center on omega it's even a close-up and you can see her eyes going back and forth and her brow starts to change like she's worried right. about what's happening you know right so for her, the impacts are are greater than in than in the past for all the reasons that we've just talked about. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, if they start arguing, is one of them going to leave again? Right. Yeah. yeah. That fear that fear creeps in. Like, okay, they're who's next? You know. Yeah. Good point. So the um, so this is where she's doing extracting the ipsium, and and the reason why she's good at extracting this stuff is because she is a force sensitive character, and we all know <laughs> that. Nice job slipping that in there. <laughs> I didn't put it in the show notes because I knew you'd take it out. Now, she's not a force user. She might be force sensitive, so I'm not going to let that go. Oh. But it, yeah, either way, so all joking aside, it was good to see her contributing in a different way, right? She's not just a lookout or, you know, some of the other roles where she's had. I mean, she's had some combative roles here this, this season, which was kind of cool. But, right. you know, using her deafness to extract this and, you know, you know the steady hands. Maybe she comes a little surgeon later on or something. Who knows? Um, okay, so this is where Hondo Jr. approaches the Havoc Marauder. And uh, steals it. <laughs> I call this Grand Theft Marauder. <laughs> oh, I make myself laugh. Um, Nicely done. Yeah. But um, so, yeah, the ship's stolen. And I don't know. I, again, I won't get it. I've already kind of blew my thunder on this one. But I just have a hard time understanding how they would have allowed that to happen. Like, you know, the poachers are out there. And, yeah, it's good to have somebody watch it. But they closed the door this time. So that's something. They they at least closed the door on the on the ship. That's true. They just didn't true. lock it, or their locks are not very good. Yeah. So I guess the question you know that comes up is how do we? And we'll get to this a little bit later, but it doesn't get addressed. But I mean, I don't think the Marauder's gone. You know, it's got to come back. It's not like hope the so. Razor Crest. Or I hope it? so. I mean, Omega's got her stuffed animal in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, so, so on that, on that note, I mean, her scene, literally her home fly away and they're just kind of like, meh, well, that sucks. Let's get back to work. And then, you know, right. it gets addressed a little bit later after the cave in. And she's like, like what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on? Like, where are your priorities? Who are you people? I don't even know you guys anymore. Right. But it's just a ship, right? They'll get another one. There's, there's plenty of them out there. So they'll figure it out at some point. They always do. Right. That's, that's where it keeps coming back to. Right. Um, Okay. So this is where the storm's coming in. They're arguing over who, who lost the ship. They head back inside. Um, yeah, we got and we get more of them kind of bickering back and forth. And then uh, what's his name? Uh, Tech mentions that the closest town was like 40 clicks away, which is kilometers, right? So that's, that's a pretty far it's a pretty good distance hike. away. Yeah. So I have a question later on, though. Like, so they were 40 kilometers away. Oh, this gosh. might be Star Wars math. And then they jumped. They fell into this like underground, like river, uh, aqueduct, whatever it was, did they go like 35 kilometers? Well, we don't know because of the underground water way. We don't know how far that swept them away, or maybe that took them a shortcut. Maybe they're going through the mountain. You had to go all the way around it in order to get to the town. Mm. So, I mean, yeah, Star Wars did away. All right. <laughs> and that's fine. I really don't. I, this is the stuff I get hung up on, of course. And so, so they, they start heading out and this is where we get the stampede scene, which that was, that was the, I mean, it was, there wasn't a lot of action. This was probably, well, this was the only action moment really outside of the, the aqueduct scene, but I had, I had flashbacks to the Lion King. Yeah. I mean, Wrecker kind of had a <laughs> Mufasa know. moment there. <laughs> right. I don't know if that was intentional or not, but I was like, well, this looks just like that scene where. Yeah, well, they've had so many homages this season anyway. It wouldn't surprise me that it just exactly. made sense. Yeah. And you're right. It, it did give a little bit of action to an otherwise pretty methodical episode. So make it at one point here too. Like I, I think it's as they're they're traversing or heading back to or trying to head to that the other town or the civilization or whatever it is. And she's sitting there kind of call uh, call trying to call Omega or call Ta or Echo. Sorry. Right. And um, you know she's really upset. He's not answering. And like again, she just this is it's almost denial. 
right? That stage of grieving where she's like, she can't accept that he's gone. And so she's going to do what she would normally do, which is reach out to him because why wouldn't he answer? And once he answers, he's going to come and save us because why wouldn't he come and save us? You know? I mean, and then they get the response from tech. Oh, he turned it off. She's like, well, Michael, why, why would he do that? <laughs> yeah, right. Why does he love me anymore? Yep. She said, I think he said he, he disabled his comm device. Right. Yeah. Like that's, you know, wow. Talk about abandonment at that point. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, gosh, he left and then he doesn't want to talk to us at all. He just, you just throw mm -hmm. it away too. Gosh, jerk. So uh, this is where we get the stampede and the, the Ipsium capsule gets swept up and then explodes as they go into the cave and it, you know, forces them into this other cave that they had found uh, another mining cave. And they're, they're kind of uh, pinned down in there at this point. Um, there's, um, there's this, the ever impending, impending storm again, that keeps going on. You can kind of hear it in the background. It's funny cause they never really got they, the storm never really hit them, I guess, until that very end right there with the, the you know, the, the Ipsium blowing up, but it's always ever present, which I thought was interesting. So, um, I think someone says, so now we're trapped. Uh, well, I think that was tech, right? On top of everything else that's going on. I, I mean, read the room, dude. Like everybody's right. on edge. You got your kid over here crying in tears and you're making comments about, you know, the obvious, which is, oh, now we're trapped inside of a cave. Great kind of thing. I mean, and they got to dig out of this place, which is not an easy task. I mean, we, you see how big these boulders were and mm -hmm. even with Wrecker, like he said, I think it's going to take them days to fish out of this thing. And they don't have the rations. They don't have the food. They don't have the water. I mean, Things are looking pretty dire at this point. Yeah. And on top of that, again, to compound even more, and this is, it's all building, right? It's, it, there's, there is an analogy between the Ipsium and how unstable it is and, and kind of what's happening in the team dy dynamic, especially like with Omega. But on top of all that, now they're in here and, you know, she, her first thing is, okay, well, I'll try to connect to the Marauder. And so she pulls out the device and she can't connect to it. And so, and then Tech doubles down again and says, Besides, it's most unlikely that the Marauder will be recovered, right? Right. So, like, he's like, forget it. Just let it go. We're not ever just going to get that thing back. Yeah, I mean, it just, I mean, you talk about melting down. I mean, it, it, it's probably about the closest we'll see Omega melt down unless someone will actually die. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, was, she, was, she had enough. She couldn't believe. And, and granted, the way that D. Bradley Baker performed that line with Tech, it came out really harsh. Yeah, like when he responds to her and so you what is your have, issue that one yeah what is your issue yeah like just the what she challenges him on and he responds that way i'm like oh snap mm -hmm. like he like the you don't know what you're doing brother i mean you, yeah. don't, you don't know what you're doing. even hunter's like what are you saying man yeah. don't do that well and that was that was before like you said she went on her she went and this is where she says but he's not here he's not with us we're supposed to be a squad this is where she's like she's the passion's coming out, right? She's really emotional. She's very angry about everything. She can't, this, again, everything that's led up into this, all these setbacks have kind of finally just set off her fuse as, as loud or as muted or muted as that may be. Uh, but it was enough to get under tech skin because he did fire back a very cold response of like, what is your issue? Like, how do you not, like, you know, and that's not, it's not how you, well, I mean, don't get me wrong. And he just didn't understand. But I well, mean, you and I know this because, we have a lot of experience with this. You do not, you do not argue with an emotional child. I mean, it just, it You're never not goes win. well. You're not going to win. You're going to make things much, much worse. Right. Much worse because you, you're not relating to them in the way, you know, getting to their level and, and connecting with them and helping them understand that they're not alone. Right. Right. And, and he's just so analytical and we get a little flavor of maybe how he's really feeling, but that's the thing that's easiest for him to do is just process the data, process the situation, come up with a solution and carry out the solution. Right. And just keep going. Mm -hmm. And he has no patience and no, I don't, I don't know what he's missing in that moment. Maybe it's just, he's never had to do it or force himself to do it and no one's called him out to. So no. why would he, why would he even consider doing any of those things to support Omega in that kind of way? Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's part of it, right? He, he looks as he, he probably looks at Omega more as a team member than a family member. <clears throat> and it's a very yeah. different approach, right? I mean, you can have a, you can be at work and have colleagues or people that you work, you study with or whatever else. And you may talk to them one way and you talk to family differently. They're, uh, well, but what I was going to say though, is think back to the first episode, right? When she's yeah. dangling off the, the wire and Hunter's like, why is Omega hanging on the ship? Well, we, you know, we had to cut study, you know, short. 
but he has faith in her to do the things that need to be done as part of the team to your point. Yeah. You know, and so, yes, he do, he does view her in that way, which she probably normally likes. Right. And she probably yeah. appreciates that whenever it's appropriate, but in these moments needing something different, sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to remember what I was saying now. I don't accomplished. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, it was about echo and, uh, yeah, I don't remember. Okay. We'll move on. I'll come back to it though. I'm sure I'll remember in a little bit. Um, so this is where, you know, Omega stomps off. She wants to be left alone. Oh my goodness. Like shades of reality with the kid right. walking off and like not wanting to talk to you and, and all that. All, all it was missing was a, a slam door. A slam door. Yeah, that's exactly it. So, and this is where he's like, I merely stated the truth. Like, yeah, you bonehead, right? You did. And that was what the problem, and that's what kind of where Hunter was. Like, this was big of Hunter to, to acknowledge that even if he, even with his limited, you know, experience thus far as a parent, he knows that there is some right or wrong things that you do. What I was, oh, here's what I was going to say, and I, I can segue right into it now. I don't want to give, I don't want to come down too hard on tech because, uh, I mean, as stable and as uh, calm by uh, calming presence as I think I can be when situations get really intense. Like I am prone to making a stupid remark, right. Uh, right. Or an emotionally charged remark. And for something like for tech, it's almost expected. Right. But you know, we've all done it. We've all said some things and went, crap, that's really not the way I should have said that. Or I should never have said that even though, yeah, like he said, it's the truth. Well, sometimes you don't, no one needs to hear the truth. And that's what Echo was saying. You, yeah, that was wrong. You actually said the truth. And we all know it's so obvious, painstakingly obvious, it doesn't need to be said. Right. A lot like leaders, parents aren't made, like there, it's a development thing. It's just over time you learn, you figure it out as you go. And you have these really tough learning moments like this one. Yeah. I mean, it, it sucks that you got to go through it and you have to have egg on your face and you have to feel like a jerk, but those are the times you actually learn and you can do something better the next time. What was really cool though, is that's when that all happens, you can see it on the faces of all three of them, even Wrecker, like Wrecker's like dumbfounded. Like, right. I mean, he's, he's probably the, he's probably the most in tune with his emotions, but it's almost like at that kid level, but all three of them seem staggered by what's just happened. Right. They, they've had a falling, like a family falling out in some regards. Um, and whether or not they acknowledge that uh, as such or, or what, you can see the impacts on their faces. Well, and I think with her, out, with her getting the emotions out, because the tension was there the entire episode from the moment they stepped off the ship at the beginning of the episode. But when, you, when they started talking, you feel and you hear it in each of their voices that they are all dealing with this in their own way. And each one of them is just not quite, they all, well, they're just all handling it themselves. Mm -hmm. rather than as a family right and so yeah. i think that's the the thing is you you hear all of that and for omega that's just extremely frustrating because she kind of hears it too and she's like why are these why can't these guys just why can't they just give me what i need even though she really can't tell them what they need and what she needs but you, you start to hear though that all of them are struggling with this so echo was an important part of this team an important part of the family and he is missed just like crosshair was mm -hmm. you know but and you they just it's just not coming out in that way and they're not going to do it again. This is kind of uh, adult men are like this in general, though. We're not really forthcoming and outgoing with our emotions and, you know, resolving these types of things very well either. So that a bunch of guys who were just bred to be fighters can't do it isn't necessarily surprising. Well, and this, yeah, exactly. And I think that's the beauty of this episode was, I think, well, I hope that some of these characters have grown from this. Like they've, they've gotten, they figure out a way to, to connect with that. I think that's happened with tech in some ways. Um, but I, I think that they are going to change. I mean, there may be some change that comes as a result of this, which is good. I think they've done a good job in this, in this series of showing that even if it's incremental, there is progress and there is movement mm -hmm. for each of these guys as they learn to not only work with one another, but work with Omega in particular. Yeah. So this is, um, at, at this point, this is all kind of about fixing the mistakes and, you know, Hunter and tech are kind of talking about what's going on. You know, he, he reminds him that, look, he's like, you know, I made the mistake. I should have, you know, with the Ipsium, but you know, Hunter's like, well, that's not the only mistake you made. You need to go fix it. <laughs> I think it was record that said, go, go check the kid. Right. right. Um, and he, he again, states the obvious. This is, this is part of uh, some of this can be defense mechanism for people, but he says, but she wanted to be alone. Like I'm, I'm honoring her wishes, even though 
he knows deep down in his heart, or we, maybe we know as people that really the best thing is to go fix it. But, you know, I, I'm going to use that as an excuse as to, as for, to not do it because I don't feel comfortable doing it. Or I don't right. want to do it. So, uh, of course he does, which is good. Um, heads over there to go t- to kind of talk to her. And uh, when he finds her, this is where she's kind of extracting Ipsium and they kind of start the very light kind of casual discussion about, you know, the trust here. Right. Um, about uh, that, whether or not uh, she extra- she trusts him to extract the Ipsium. And his response is most of his responses lack any kind of feeling whatsoever. Like he just said, I, I, I thought I wrote it down on here, he, but he trusts her ability to do the job, basically. Yeah, like, why couldn't you, like, this is where it's like, oh, ec- or tech, you're so frustrating. This is where it, it drives me nuts. It's like, she asks you a question. Why can't you just say, yeah, I trust you, Mega. That's it. That's all any normal human person needs to hear. And yet he gives this crap canned response that's so logically driven that, again, it's just disconnect again for Omega. Like, he can't. He, right. It's and I get un- it. I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not, I get why he's there. I'm not trying to say anything about that, but yeah. that's the part that is frustrating. Yeah, it's just too articulate for what needs to be said in the moment. But again, I think she also understands him to the point where she does soften a little bit too, right? I mean, she does, it, it is affirmation that she is valued and that the, he sees her and that he trusts her to be able to do the job. You know, and so she she's able to relax a little bit and eat, and some of that tension does dissipate. Mm-hmm. And so I think it, it, so while he may not have said it in the way that we would have loved for him to say it and maybe that she really needed I think he did, he was honest with her. And I think that's what she appreciates is that she knows that he is being honest. He's not going to not tell her the truth and for him to come out and say, yeah, I trust you to do your job. You know, and again, that's just, it's something that at least it helped bridge the gap a little bit and at least open the door, you know, just, even if it was a crack, it at least opened it back up so they could start to talk. Yeah. And the, so I'm giving him a little bit of a break there. No, I, no, I feel, I, I get it. Like, I, I don't want to be too hard on him because like he's, he does come around. Like he does grow. He's kind of trying. Yeah. Yeah. He, and he's, yeah, he's trying. There's a, but so in this, this small piece here, there is, it does feel like she grows, like it almost like she aged three years in this little moment because the way she talks to tech at the very end of this, when she says, basically go grab my satchel monkey, you know what I mean? Like the way it was very, it was very grown up ish. Like, I mean, you could, there was, it was still laced with a little bit of bitterness because of what had just happened, you know, but she's like, let's just, let's stick to the mission. Go get my stuff. Like she doesn't even make eye contact with them. It's not like a sweet, can you please go get my bag or anything? It's like, go get my stuff. You know, it's just, I don't know. It was a different side of Omega that we had not seen a very more mature uh, side of her grown up side, at least the way she approached the dialogue and all that. And, you know, it's. I I viewed it a little bit different. I viewed it more as her almost disconnecting a little bit too and acting like the one that she's around and, and hmm. reducing some of that emotional heaviness that goes with it with a bit of sass in there. But yeah. And so I, I think I viewed it more in that respect, you know, like a preteen would do. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like fine. Attitude. Sassy. You want to work? We'll get to work. Go get my stuff. Yeah. That's kind of how I viewed it. What did you think about, um, you know, she's trying to get the, Ipsium and she's about to extract it, trying to get that one last vial and we can't, you know, some time passes and they've got one more vial that's left. And so they're just kind of sticking to the job. So, you know, to kind of keep their minds up, I doubt they really had any other conversations up until this point, but anyway, so she's about to fall in and she does, she falls into it. I just, it was interesting that like, it was shocking one that she fell like, like, holy crap. Like I wasn't thinking about water underneath there. He just jumped right after her, right? Unconsciously. Didn't even think about her. Yep. So... I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a part of me that, that thinks that, wait, was that the right thing? Would I have done that? I don't know that I would have done that. Like, cause he has no idea what's down there, right? Exactly. I mean, she just jumped and you just hear her voice trail off. Now, granted, he may have made, take a calculated risk of saying, well, the likelihood that there's something down there to catch you. But then again, you and I probably think similarly in this one. No, she's, she's my kid. She's my, she's, She's my part of my family. I'm just, I'm going after her because that's what I need to do. I, I need to go rescue her. I need to go check that she's okay. And the first inclination isn't for his own safety. It's to do and go after her and do something and try. And so I thought that was really, I, I caught that too. And I thought it was really great. And it was very understated too, how they did it, how they approached it. Mm-hmm. It was just like, boom, it was done. And they never talked about it really either. 
Like, yeah. hey, you came after me. You know, they, of course he did. Maybe it comes up in the next episode. Because I got to wonder, like, she's, I would ask, like, what the heck happened? Like, I fell in there. How did you fall in there? Right. Oh, so Dale's, Dale's still my thunder. This is what I was going to say. I was going to say, Jonesy, you give me too much credit. You're telling me that I would have done that as a parent. I would have done that as the Anakin Skywalker and said his fate will be the same of ours as ours. So, but that was the joke and now it's been deflated. So thanks, dude. Um, that's, that's why we're all here for you. <laughs> that's why we're all here. Okay. So they fall into this uh, aqueduct and kind of get swept away 35, 40 clicks. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Down the <laughs> road uh, in there. Um, and then Hunter's like paternal instinct kicks in, right? He knows something's wrong. Um, not sure what it is. I'm saying he's force sensitive. Maybe it was a mega. Okay, here you go. Oh, he's he's so, a tracker, man. No, he, listen, he senses listen. something happened. No, listen though. So Omega no, she pulls a Leia or pulls a Han or a, sorry, pulls a Luke and connects to him through the force. And that's how he knew that there was something. No, I'm kidding. Okay, so yes, he's a tracker. Break. He's a hunter. Yes. Six cents kicked in, whatever it is. That's fine. So they go after Omega and uh, Tech. And uh, <clears throat> this is right when they get kind of washed on shore. And of course they relay back and they get the whole explanation as to what's happened. Okay. This finally forwards into, uh, Oh wait, before we do that, I love that uh record just goes, Rawr, I hate this planet. I don't know what I laughed every time I saw this episode. I don't know what it was about it, but I thought it was great. Well, wasn't there somebody else in star Wars who said something similar about hating this planet? Okay. I don't know. Omega said it too, this episode. Did she really, I didn't catch that if that was the case. Okay. Uh, something to that effect, at least. Yeah, she talked right. about we're never going to get off this planet or I hate this planet or whatever it was. All right. Well, let's let's talk about the Omega and Tech scene because this is really where the meat of this whole conversation or the the whole, at least for me, again, the whole episode. It was a really was, brief scene, too. That's the... Well, that's there the wasn't part. a lot here. You're right. It was brief, but I think it was pretty heavy weighted for what we've got. And I want to, all relative, right, to what we've had historically with the show. You know, this isn't Andor where we're getting like, week after week of deep monologues and, and all that stuff. But I mean, for what this show does, this was a little bit different than I think we've had. And I think this is where, uh, what was her name? Miss Brooke uh, Roberts, I think came into play here. Right. But what did you think about the scene? Like what were some of the big I guess, touching moments for you? Well, again, I love that there was no music. It was just the two of them. Mm -hmm. And they just, they just kind of come right out and start talking. You know, how can you feel this way? How do you, how can you think about this? I thought we were a squad. I thought we were a family. And that's the moment that tech, it just, it just triggers. And I like that she just lets him just be, just be there in that moment for a minute and just process it, you know, and that he actually took a moment to, know, just to be a little vulnerable. And, and granted, that's probably about as vulnerable as, as tech gets, right? Of saying, you know, I might process things differently than y'all do, but, I do have feelings that I do have, it does affect me in some way. And again, he didn't necessarily have to come out and say anything deep or break down in tears or anything, but just acknowledging it that he does feel Echo's loss and it does mean something to him, even if he is not super expressive about it and does believe that they need to just move on because that's what, that's what they need to do. It helped Omega at least say, I'm not alone. Right. And if the, if the least compassionate and the least emotional member of this family can acknowledge that and, and say that they're, they're dealing with this, then it just makes me feel better, right? Mm -hmm. Just a little bit better. And I think that was just really important for him to have that. But again, it was, it was her leading the question, asking the question, just kind of, I mean, she just kind of dumped it out there. I'm not giving her any more, a lot of credit in that regard. She just kind of, you know, outburst. But I like that he actually sat there and, and took the question and thought about it. And hadn't really and affirmed for her that they are a family. Yeah, you know, when he's probably never truly said that before. And so it was a, kind of a big moment for him. Yeah. Well, and yeah, she poses a question. We're more than that. We're family, aren't we? He says, yes, yes, of course we are. And then she really kind of puts it on him and says, then why do you act like that? And there's this cool moment there where he just pauses and, and they hold on there for, you know, five, six seconds long where it's just silent. And he's kind of looking yeah. around, just looking left and right, thinking about things. And I thought he's processing like 8 million different responses and trying to pick the best one for it. And I right. think he does. Like he says, uh, Echo chose a different path as did Crosshair. I have respect. I have to respect their decision. Even though it can be difficult to understand, we must carry on. I may process moments and thoughts differently, but it does not mean that I feel any less than you. Now, this is a very, like, again, I hate to use Spock because it's Star Trek, but 
Yeah. This is a very Vulcan response, right? Somebody who acknowledges that there may be emotions and feelings there, but it's just they're they're not uh, in a position to they to, don't to kind of respond them. like everybody else. Well, and they don't control them, right? Right. They don't I control love them. They're not. Yeah, exactly. I love it when he mentions Crosshair though that they linger on on Omega's response. Mm-hmm. Like, holy smokes, he thinks about Crosshair. Like, we haven't yeah. talked about Crosshair in forever, right? Yeah, you know, but that it lingers and that he still think you know, that it's a consideration for him and it's that close to the surface. Mm-hmm. Again, just just offers that little bit more for him. So this is um, I, what I really enjoyed about the scene is for all the things you said. Like, there's no music. The lighting is very uh, low. Right? It, there's it's a very it's very focused. The shots are very tight on the characters. They've done a good job artistically to kind of give us just them to focus on those two with, uh, without anything else going on. On top of that, you have essentially a parent and their child, father, daughter, having this conversation. And, and for kids, like we've not really talked about this so much and, and specifically, but change is always hard for children, right? And, and to bring it back to real world, if you're moving schools or, you know, kids that go through divorce or even just dealing with things like, you know, uh, you know, puberty or you know life changes that come around, right? Yeah, there you go. The lighting here is freaking awesome. We're, sorry, we just pulled up the image of of them kind of sitting down and talking together. But but change is very difficult for children, right? It, they like stability. They like routines. And anytime that happens, it can make a child feel uncomfortable. And of course, I don't expect any of the clones to understand that. And it's not nothing that I like. Oh, I knew this when I was thirteen. Like this is stuff that you learn about and, and, and get better at uh, and understand more as you get older. Uh, uh, but, but this was that moment, right? This is exactly what was happening here. She was trying to, they were trying to kind of un- come to a mutual understanding of who they were and how they were dealing with it. And for Omega, it was like you said, it's as simple as yes. Okay. At least you're acknowledging that it is impacting you. Right. You know, I mean, feel, I may not feel the same and it looks very different than how I feel, but at least you're acknowledging it and it gives me enough to kind of move forward. Right. And that, and we see that at the very end because then she comes full circle and uses his own line about, you know, we'll change or adapt or I don't know, I've got it written down here in just a second, but, but that was, that was a really, again, big moment for her. But I just love the fact that it was just those two dad, daughter, having this conversation, trying to hash things out and uh, him making himself vulnerable. Now, the other thing that I didn't, we didn't mention, but they had just kind of survived death. I don't know. Maybe they didn't think in that term, but I mean, they both took this leap of faith and fell from a cliff, jumped, fell into a river for God knows how long. And so I think for that, that might've been enough for tech to really kind of feel that may have been the icebreaker for tech to kind of be more open to sharing his emotions since, I mean, he was coughing just as much as she was. So, you know, that probably was the primer for them to get here. And then the fact that, okay, well, there's nobody else around. We got nothing else to do. Let's just hash this out. And he takes his, you know, puts his best foot forward to kind of take a stab at it. And I think he does a good job. At least he, he does enough to connect with Omega for the first time, maybe ever. And and I, I don't, and I mean that sincerely. Like, I don't know that Omega really understood tech. Like, he's always been kind of this weird character and that's just who he is. But she's never had the kind of connectedness that she's had with Hunter, with, uh, I was going to say Crosshair, but Crosshair is totally different. But she's never connected with him the way she may have done with Wrecker and Hunter or even Echo, who I think she was probably most connected with by the time we got to that last episode. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it, he's not an easy character to it. I mean, he's been like the teacher too at times, right? So he's the one leading the lessons. I think they, they all probably lead their own version of a lesson depending on what they excel at, but it's always been in, in more of an instructor in, I don't know, an emotionally distant relationship. They get right. along, they're fine. There's nothing wrong with their relationship, but there's never really anything deeper than that and she hasn't had to have the moments like she has with hunter where hunter's been the clear father figure you know throughout the you know throughout the episodes and throughout the the season and a half here yeah i want to go to um i had this in the show notes but i am not and i should have reached out to jeff like i'm not an expert on this uh, by any means uh, but i'd consider this as well and um, i don't know if anybody's asked this question yet uh about it but uh, he says, seeing a lot of autism discourse as well, which is interesting. As someone who has worked in the field most of my professional life, it was good to see people feel represented. And I think there may be a part of that. Like, you know, I, at the beginning, I said, like, I hate folks that are kind of like this. And I don't mean people that are that, you know, have autism. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about people that are just like too macho to share their feelings, too macho to connect with people, too macho to express how they're doing, or at least even just try. Like, oh, I don't know how it that's the stuff that bothers me, but autism, a totally different thing. And yes, there are signs of that, like from him, 
um, what's this sh- like Sheldon from that, the comedy series, right? He's a, um, the extreme too. example of something like that, where they just, it's so black and white and it's, they're, they're struggling with it all. So I think there could be something here as well that this is, is playing into it with him, but I'm glad he brought it up and I didn't cause I would have completely botched the message there. So thank you, Jeff. Okay. Um, all right. So wonderful scene, really enjoyed it. Really good moment. And again, all things considered, this is a pretty big moment for this series because we don't get a lot of time with the characters in this fashion. So, uh, so back to the story, Landho. Finally, you know, we get a wrecker and hunter who wash up on shore and uh, they've managed to bring the, the bag. There was a moment in there when they were talking about how I think uh, like it was tech that was telling them how, what they needed to do and mentioning that. Oh, and by the way, as you're being traversed of the rapids, you know, just don't blow up because, you know, you got all that ipsium with you. Right. You uh, know what's funny is during this moment, like this really heavy scene and all of that. And then when I'm watching it the very first time. The, the thought that popped in my head was, huh, they're actually going to successfully accomplish a mission for once. <laughs> Just out of nowhere, I'm like, they actually they actually might follow through with this one. <laughs> well, it might, yeah. They might so have another episode, so maybe not. But, you know, where, where they failed, I was, because early on I was like, man, they just failed another one. And then she found it. I mean, she hit the mother load, by the way. Right. And that's load was an L-O-D-E, if you know what I mean. So, oh, yeah, good job. All that Warcraft paying off. But yeah, so I mean, but it was like, finally, they might actually be successful. Wouldn't yeah. that be something? Uh, wouldn't, that be the, some, wouldn't that be something if, if Sid was responsible for them going, thinking she was going to get rid of them to go back to your thought, and then they came back and actually, right. you know, yeah, like hit, all this Ipsium, hit the yeah. jackpot, you know? Yeah. Well, we'll come back to my theory. And we're almost to the point where I'm going to come back to my theory here in a little bit. So uh, they blow up the, there was, and there's some symbolism too. I forgot to mention, like, when she's she turns off her lamp like earlier on when she walks away to go be alone it's in, interesting that she turns off her lamp because she wants to be in the dark which i thought was kind of like well that's a little bit morbid or, or maybe that morbid but sorted right and and so she turns the lamp off and then there's a light right. and so she goes to the light and then that's kind of leads her to her next phase here's the same thing right they get into this one cave and then there's a little light that's coming through uh, right so it's almost like this guiding light that's kind of leading her through this episode leading her through this development of her character as well um, but like for her they, relationship with tech too. Okay. Yeah, uh, exactly. Right. There's symbolism there uh, as well. Check. Checking all the boxes. Yeah. But there's uh, so there's, uh, they decide to blow it up and I'll, I'll <laughs> we'll blow the light up. It's going to be fine. Yeah. Well, I thought it was cool too, because I think we, we got uh, this season, we got the reminder that Wrecker doesn't like heights, but then we also got the reminder that he's obsessed with blowing stuff up. You remember and we haven't had that yet. So he was fighting over whether he was mad because tech was going to get to blow it up and he would. And the tech gives him some technical reason why it can't be him. Right, which I, which I laughed about because so tech's response was, it has to be a very precise shot. Otherwise, you know, we'll, we'll basically create what we had before where we'll have a cave in. Omega just kind of tossed it on the rock though. So it wasn't exactly <laughs> it wasn't a super place. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. But again, maybe, maybe where he hit it on the vial mattered. I don't know, but. It seemed like a pretty weak response. Just a, it was. just another thing to poke poor Wrecker. Yep. He doesn't get to blow stuff up. He just wants to have a little fun. It's going to be fun. Yeah. What a far cry from that. Yeah. It, things are still be fun, fun right now. Yeah. Where she's at. Big swing there. Um, okay. So they get out there. There's a spaceport in sight. Uh, Omega leads the way. I don't know if that was intentional or what, but she does take the first step forward and they kind of fall in behind her. As they head out to the spaceport, they get there and it turns out that it's abandoned and it's been abandoned for, for some time, very, very long time is according to, I think what tech was doing. As he Again, was very assessing. reminiscent of the old, you know, the gold boom in Boston. I mean, yeah. very, very, I think that that was probably the inspiration for a lot of this, you know, the mm-hmm. gold rush. And when it dried up, towns just completely went bare and they were left as is. Yeah. They, uh, they do find this long range array kind of thing that's still there and so this is how they communicate with uh, sid so they call in the favor to sid of hey we need your help we lost our ship and et cetera, et cetera. and what a and jerk is, response man well yeah and see this is yeah so back to the theory uh i don't think she was expecting them to call right um especially not for a ride. i think it's a what's that especially not for a ride <laughs> exactly not for well i mean if she if she was yeah, exactly. Not for a ride, but I think 
the theory is that she went and like she did all she arranged for that ship to be stolen and, and knew where they were going to be and sent somebody out there to steal it again i don't know what the motive is but the fact that they're calling her would had to have been shocking and i think that put her on her heels and why she was quick to say sorry i can't help you like no i can't do it because it does seem kind of, kind of cold now at the same time you know um if you watch her body language she's looking at everybody and it's only after she focuses on omega because omega says uh, what was her? she says something like you have to help us or something to that effect. Yeah, I saw her, her glance down just briefly. They didn't they didn't really linger too much on it. Yeah, I don't think I wrote that that what she said down, but she does say, look, he, like she's like, what do you mean? Like Omega's got it on her face too. Like how can you do this? How can you say no? And it's and like she's avoiding contact eye contact with her, and then she finally does look down at Omega, and it's at that moment that she's like, crap. I can't even after tech had already told her, look, we saved your butt from, you know, Roland Durand and Malegi and all that. But I think it really was that relationship that she had with Omega that is paying dividends now and it got her better conscience at this point to be like, OK, I'll do something. We don't know what that's going to be, but I have a feeling I do feel like she is going to follow through on that. Well, and then she said, give me a few days. And they were like, no, no, no. And she just click. Yeah. You, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. Right. Like, what is, what is Sid doing that she has to, she's doing nothing. She's wiping so down that's, counters. That's the question about as we get into the next episode. Do we go and visit, like, where Sid is at to understand we get that side of things. And so while the Bad Batch is just kind of surviving or, or I don't know, doing whatever it is they're doing, do we go and spend time with Sid to see what she's up to in order to actually do the extraction then uh, once she's available to do so? Mm -hmm. Or do you think, no, we just kind of stick with the Bad Batch? Um. I don't, I don't, I think we'll probably stick with the Bad Batch just because it feels like it is more focused on them. I mean, the episode, they could do, they could go a different route, but. But we've been asking for a long time and I know Jeff doesn't like Sid in the chat, got that. But we've been <laughs> talking about for a long time that we need something more from Sid and we need to understand her a little bit better. We need to understand a little bit more about her past. Like yeah. some of those things are pretty interesting to us, but also how she feels about this team. And what is she doing outside of all of this? And what is her motive? Like, what's her direction? What's her steer? What's her end game? Yeah. And I think this might be that opportunity if they wanted to take it to where we could get some of those questions answered as well within the context of how does she view this team? How does she view them as a collective family? You know, maybe more in Omega's terms that Sid's part of the family, but, you know, is Sid kind of feeling that tug as well. And I think it would be, this is a great opportunity to be able to go back and revisit that. And then for her to come in and repay some of her debts and see just how she feels about this team. Yeah. I hadn't considered that, but I, I wouldn't be opposed to that. If they start the episode with Sid and they, that becomes the primary focus and it, <clears throat> we eventually get to her coming back and rescuing them. Right. Right. I wouldn't be opposed to that at all. Is it what you're right? I think we need something from her. Like, they introduced her last season. We didn't get a whole lot um, expected to get more this season. And they've already kind of planted those seeds of she's more than who we think she is right or wrong. So yeah, it's now's a great the point. opportunity. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's time to figure out, I mean, we're, we're on the back half of the season. Right. And so we're running out of opportunities for some of that to come out. And this is a really good chance because they're in a jam. They need the help. They won't last super long and they're very resourceful they'll figure something out for the most part but at some point kind of like rogue one you just kind of run out of chances you run out of opportunity mm -hmm. you know no matter how good you are if you're on a barren planet you are still on a barren planet you know so it would be really great and plus maybe it'll turn jeff's cold scaly heart a little bit warmer towards sid yeah man God, yeah, give her a break jeff dude. he's just trying to make her way in the galaxy Set up. That's so dumb. Okay. So uh, from there we get to actually, that was actually funny. So we get to Omega. So she, like you said, she cuts the transmission. Sid cuts the transmission off when they say, look, we don't have enough rations. And so they're left thinking like, how are we supposed to figure this out? Like, how are we going to get food? And it's Omega of all the people. It's Omega now who steps up and reiterates the same lines she, that, that uh, tech said earlier, which is we'll figure it out. Like we always do. Right. And, and at that point they kind of, Look at each other. They look at each other, and there's a nod from Tech. He kind of nods in approval, and then she kind of nods, and there's a smile there. So it, you, know, you you get that they've they've connected and they understand each other. Maybe not a hundred percent, but they're in a much better position than they were, you know, going into this episode. 
And Omega is on that kind of path to recovery and acceptance a little bit too, right? You, right. you talked about the, the stages of grief, mm -hmm. you know, so she's moved on and she's progressing through them. But of course we close out with the storm mm -hmm. roiling in the background, of course, yep. as we, as we cut to black. Looming in the background. Yeah. It does right. kind of fade to black very slowly. And then again, they roll that thunder rolls for like a, about a second or two, even after when they're in black. So kind of ominous that they did that before they run the the main uh title or main uh theme for the bad batch yeah and then the bindu showed up again <laughs> and then the bindu showed up so that's kind of and that's where it ends so all, all, all i think it was good um i got a couple questions here you know looking ahead the next episode's called the retrieval i don't know why anybody would think we're not gonna wrap this episode it's not a two-parter but there i've seen some people go questioning oh is it gonna be a two-parter oh yeah dude they're not gonna and they've, got to resolve, they've got to resolve the problem. <laughs> I mean, they don't just show up back at Sid's Parlor. Wow, we really right, got out of a hairy one. This isn't season three where Mandalorian shows up, where the Mando shoves up with Baby Yoda. I mean, right. that's all right. They wouldn't do that. Yeah. Luke Skywalker is going to come in on the X Wing. Who and knows? Save the day. So, I, the question that I had out there again was what is the crossing? And so, yeah. I don't, I still don't know. Like, now that we've dissected this to the nth degree, like, I still have a hard time really pinpointing what it could be and maybe it maybe that's intentional maybe once we've seen the next episode we know what the crossing is relevant to what the retrieval is uh but thoughts on what the retrieval is is it the marauder i think it's the retrieval of the bad batch at this picking point. them up yeah but I get them out. okay that would be a sid thing then i think that's one point for you know a sid story or getting to see the back behind the scenes and what she's doing i would really like to see that i mean i don't i don't know if they have the gusto to go that route and give her kind of her own episode of sorts. But I think you could give her half to two thirds of the episode still and, and still have something really good and, and give us more about that character. I think the crossing is still very much, I think again, it was partially Omega, you know, coming to terms, moving through the, the stages of grief, but also pulling tech a little bit further towards her too and meeting in the middle. So I think it was more about just finding this common ground and maybe all of them, I don't know, maybe embracing more the idea of family, maybe tech recognizing this idea of family and embracing it. Cause he's, I don't think he's ever used this term and, and the squad as a general, I mean, throughout, I don't think anybody's ever used family, even no. though you, you just, it just emanates off of Omega. Right? Well, and it's, it's ironically, they call each other brothers, right? And that right. right in first family, but they, they don't really, yeah, I guess these guys don't really call each other brothers, do they? Not no, like you don't hear them say that a lot. They just call each other by their names. Yeah, Even when like they're talking Rex. to like Rex and those guys, they don't use that as, as uh, freely as the clones do, right? And I think that's a product of their environment. I mean, they've, they've been different. They've been special. Yeah, they don't, they don't associate with, with the, the regs at all, right? Yeah, yeah. So they, and they're all so unique that they probably don't feel like they're all that, you know, linked or related in any kind of way, except that they sell, share a, a core genetic, you know, source material. But yeah, I think, uh, yes, I think the crossing maybe more in that regard. And I think, yeah, the retrieval, retrieval to Bad Batch, maybe there's retrieving something else too. Maybe it's the Marauder. Maybe it's, I mean, it doesn't seem like we'd go back to, you know, towards like an, uh, towards an Echo or something like that. But mm -hmm. it could also be a bit more, a little deeper. Maybe it's the retrieval of Sid's soul <laughs> of sorts, you know, of her. I mean, it, again, yeah. it could be. It could be multiple things and maybe that's a part of it too is her kind of going back to maybe not how she was because it sounds like she was a bit of a, a swindler and a you know kind of a oh what's the uh, what's han solo uh pirate scoundrel scoundrel there you go yeah, yeah. scoundrel so maybe more of her a, a bit of a redemption you know in the eyes of the team maybe what omega has seen in her all along you know is finally able to to come about so probably pushing that a little too hard but I, I would like to have that opportunity for Sid to, to come out and give us a reason to care about her finally. Yeah. You know, she seems like there's something there. Let's, let's explore that and let's see what there is there, what's actually there. Let's find um, out who she really is. What about the, and I echo all that, no pun intended. What about the, uh, the town? Do you think we're going to find out uh, more about the town? Do you think that's relevant to even from a story perspective? Like, um, no, not relevant to the story B. It was abandoned because it was an old mining town. Yeah, I was trying to think if maybe there's, I don't know where they're going to get food from. Maybe they go hunt the stampede things, right? And use those for food. I was actually shocked there wasn't a worm or something in the, in the, in the mines and everything. Cause they had the holes kind of cut out. 
you know, they were just probably just drilling holes or just digging, but no, like naturally born holes by sandworms I thought, from exactly. Yeah. I thought for sure we were going to have a monster of the week come about in this whole thing. True. So I was actually quite happy that we didn't. Maybe we'll this next episode, they kill it and they eat it. Maybe so. Yeah. Why so. is it like on desert planets? You have these gigantic worms. Like what the hell are they eating? It's what I've been, I've been, I've been saying that forever. Doesn't like, make any forever. Sense. Since like 1987, I've been wondering how that space slug. No, let me go back. So 1980, how the space slug got as big as it did. Right, on an asteroid. On an asteroid. Trying to eat ships. Yeah. Yeah. I think they did explain like it, it like moves around. It just hadn't made that its home, kind of like a snail in a shell. Oh, okay. That's how they legends fixed it. But, but still, it's pretty big. Oh, uh, you know how many Millennium Falcons it needs to consume on a day just to maintain its weight? It's quite a bit. Okay. So the other, the other question I have is around um, the, the thief. The mysterious thief, like, like, let's say they don't get the Marauder back, which I think would be shocking and tragic. And I just don't think they would go there because it's too iconic, more so than the Razor Crest, arguably, uh, because it's been around for a while now. Um, so, well, and the emotional attachment to it with Wrecker making Omega a little room for herself and yeah. giving her the stuffed animal, and that's been her refuge. It, very different than the Razor Crest, yeah. Sure, sure. So, so, but. You know, if they're going after the ship, then I would, and this is where the question was. The question was whether or not we would see uh, uh, Hondo Jr. pop up again. And I think if they're going to go after the Marauder, then that's a, that's a yes. And I think we are going to learn the identity of who that person is and the motive, which I don't, like right now, that is the big mystery to me. Like, why would somebody, outside of just the plain old Marauder or Marauder uh, pirate or was it a poacher, mm -hmm. you know? Which just doesn't seem like, I don't know. Doesn't if Hondo shows up, I'm going to lose my mind. You know this, right? Yes. 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 It's going to be yes. bad. It's going to be bad. It'll it's be really be bad. bad. It'll be really bad. Because I'm going to bring Maz into it. It's going to be a whole oh, thing. Oh, Lord. I know what we're going to do for the next six Patreon episodes. Well, good luck. One man shows are tough, but I'm sure you can do it. Uh, that's why we got Lauren. She'll do it with me. <laughs> that's right. We're bringing, bringing our contingency. She's bringing the she big can, guns. Yep. She'll do a better job covering Moz than I will. I can tell you that. All right. Well, I think that's, I can't, well, I guess we'll leave it there. I mean, this is, um, uh, for an episode. Dale that, did, Dale did pick uh, pull out the, you know, there were antelope there. So presumably they could go hunt. That's why I said the stampede, they go kill whatever those things were in oh, the stampede. Yeah, right. yeah. I missed that. Sorry. Yeah. No, 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 you're fine. I don't want Dale taking all the credit. He's already taking credit for two things. Stop stealing <laughs> my, my show notes, bro. But yeah, I mean, that's, they've already kind of shown it to us. So why yeah. wouldn't they, you know? But uh, yeah, so again, good episode. I did enjoy it. It did feel kind of different coming off the last two episodes, given that was really mythology driven, heavy mythology driven. But I did love this a lot because it gave us those moments that I've been wanting from the Clone Wars specifically and specifically even more the Bad Batch themselves because we don't This was get very a lot of reminiscent of the time. We talk, we talk about this a lot. We bring it up a lot. When Yoda was talking with the clones, right? In one yeah. of those really early yep. episodes. This was yep. very reminiscent of that where a quiet moment using the opportunity to connect and break down walls, right? Very different. I mean, very different scenario, of course, but just that this is what this is why the Bad Batch can be so good, like with that connection to Clone Wars and that it's just so connected in that way. Mm -hmm. I really like that we captured that spirit here yet again. So that's Yoda was talking to the clones making them feel better. Yoda was force sensitive. Omega is talking to the clones. No, she's a clone better. talking to the clones. So now it's very Omega. Is now it's sensitive. so, now it's so meta. It's like poetry. It rhymes. No, it's just meta. Okay. We'll figure out a way to segue into thanking our Patreon or people that showed up tonight on that. Yeah. You know what? It's really meta, Albert. <laughs> <laughs> How amazing all these people That's are that come so out egregious. and see us. It's funny. Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Please. Carry, right. Continue on. Well, I mean, that's kind of my thing. And no, it, hey, thank you everyone who came out for the live stream tonight. We had a great showing. I appreciate all of the chat. Dale, thank you for stealing Albert's Thunder more than once. Jeff, thank you for all of the intelligence you bring to the show that we are unable to do consistently. So, uh, but no, thank you to everyone who, who came out tonight. Jonathan, Lauren, Nase, Steph, Jeff. Dale, Larry, Mike B, Sky, Jorge, and Hard Counter. If I missed anyone, my sincerest apologies. That's not intentional. Uh, if you are curious about coming out to the live stream, cantinacast.com slash YouTube. It will tell, we'll point you over to the YouTube channel and you can subscribe. You can get the little bell, notify whenever we're going to go live. 
And again, if you'd like to hear us talk about uh, the different clones that we have for, you know, that uh, about what we saw in the clone conspiracy and some legends material, cantitacast.com slash Patreon. That is out there right now, both the video and the audio only. So if you have a preference there, it's at the After Dark tier. So we invite you to take care or take a look at that. Tell us what you think. Leave us your comments. Leave us your feedback. We love to hear it. We love hearing from everyone and certainly appreciate it. And on top of all that, we have this Sunday, we've got a Patreon show. It'll be Lauren and I. We're hashing out the details right now, but uh, don't worry. We have something coming. So we'll get that out. We've also got uh, working and negotiating a time to do our top three moments from season two of The Mandalorian. I'm going to get that ahead of March 1st because that's when Mandalorian starts. And then looking at the schedule, my Lord, we got all kinds of Star Wars stuff. I don't know. We're going to be doing like two, three shows a week at, point, at some point here uh, just because it's probably going to have to happen on top of that. You've got Jedi Novel Archives, so you, Lauren's YouTube stuff that she's doing there over the, the books. Uh, I don't want to steal her thunder, but I'm so excited about what she was talking about today. Okay, I'm not going to say yeah. it, but she's she's going to cover something that I'm like like giddy. Like, ooh, I can't wait to see what she does. And she's never read it, and so I'm so excited. You guys are, are in for a treat when she does cover that. But yeah, lots and lots of stuff still coming down the pipe here. Yeah, you know, Mando around the corner, so we're going to have a final hype show. You know, we always bring that to y'all oh, right yeah. before as well. So yeah, I mean, a lot to cram in here in, in less than two weeks, less than two weeks until Mando. And then we're going to have Bad Batch and Mando at the same time. There's some vision stuff going on at the same time as well, but we're not going to be able to cover it all of it, but celebration. we got celebration. Yeah. But you know, Lauren's covering the books. She's going to step in and help us out. I'm sure as well. So uh, be on the look. We're going to try to pump as much, much as that out as we can on time. And then we'll, we'll come back to the things that maybe we weren't able to quite get to, or that we had to, we had to bump for precedence on the other, on the others. Cause there's only, there's only three of us, so we do what we can. All right. Well, with that, we will see you guys here in just a few days for our Patreon show. You're still listening? Wow. That's amazing. Well, I'm here to give you the disclaimer. Normally, we do a big, long, drawn-out disclaimer thing saying what's what and who's what and all that other stuff, but I think you guys kind of know that Lucasfilm and Disney have... Uh, no affiliation with us at all, uh, and we have none with them. Uh, we talk about Star Wars, which is their property and all that other good, fun stuff, uh, but I think you can tell which is our stuff and which is their stuff. If you can't, well, then send a lawyer to send an email to me, and I'll be glad to chat with them. Other than that, you know what's what, so that's your disclaimer. 